Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Chantal Autre. I am the Communications Officer at the Partnership for Economic Policy, and I would like to briefly share some housekeeping points before we begin. We invite you to ask questions to our panelists at any time during this event. Please use the Ask a Question space or the chat space on the right of your screen to submit your questions. The panelists will answer these questions after the main discussion. You're free to use the general chat box to communicate to all participants, but please note we may miss questions if they are not submitted via the ask a question function. Please keep in mind, this is a public session. Please be courteous and remain on topic. If you are having any technical difficulties, you can click on the question mark on the bottom left of your screen to contact tech support. Please be aware that we are recording this event and we'll share it on our YouTube channel and website. I now hand over to our moderators for today. Veronica Amarente is a professor at the Institute of Economics in the Economics Department at the University of the Republic Uruguay. And Cabrama Bay is a country program leader at the International Food Policy Research Institute. Cabram and Veronica are, bar are both PEP research fellows. The latter was part of a group of PEP research fellows that conducted a series of studies on the underrepresentation of researchers from the global south in development economics. Veronica, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chantal. Well, first of all, I would like to thank all the participants and of course uh, our the panelists for sharing this time with us. Uh, and let me just take a pair of minutes to give some framework about the discussion that we are about to start. Uh, this is a discussion that we at the PEP community consider of very high relevance. And uh, we, a group of research fellows, which uh, both Kibram and I integrate, has been discussing about the lack of diversity in development economics, which limits the discipline's fairness and efficacy. In this framework, we have produced evidence about how researchers from developing countries uh, or thousand researchers as we call them are represented or, or underrepresented, I should say, uh, in three areas of research, conference presentations, uh, articles published in, in, in academic journals and citations in, in academic publications. In the light of this evidence, PEP has launched a call to action, which you can access and sign at PEP's webpage and which includes some specific recommendations that we consider, uh, we hope may help to defeat or at least to weaken the practices and paradigms that exclude thousand researchers from academic dialogues. So I encourage all the participants to please take a look at this call to action and adhere, of course, if, if, you, if you agree, if you wish. In this specific seminar, we want to concentrate uh, on the underrepresentation of thousand researchers in development uh, journals. So we will focus on the area of publications. And before I introduce the panelists, uh, let me just give you some basic findings about uh, our uh, previous research. If we consider uh, publications in the top 20 development journals from 1990 to 2019, close to three quarters, 73%, were written by researchers located in Northern institutions. So that's what we call Northern researchers in, in, our, in our article. And fewer than one six were, uh, were written by uh, researchers located in Southern countries or Southern researchers. The remaining 11% uh, were written in collaborations with researchers from North and South institutions. So in the light of this evidence, we have invited four prestigious panelists, which are closely linked to publications in development economics, to share their reflections with us. And let me introduce the panelists who will join in us. Christopher Barrett, who is an agricultural and development economist at Cornell University, where he holds various positions, and he is a co-editor-in-chief of the journal Food Policy. Enrica Chiapero Martinetti, who is a full professor uh, of economic policy at the University of Pavia, and uh, he has been the founder of the Human Development and Capability Association, and she has served as vice president, and she's now chief editor of the Journal of Human Development and Capabilities. Marcel Pavchamps, who is uh, a senior fellow at the Freeman Pauli Institute for International Studies, and a professor by courtesy at the Department of Economics at Stanford University, 
uh, his research includes economic development, market institutions, and social networks, and he is the editor in chief of the economic development and cultural change. And Andy McKay, Andy is a professor of development economics at the University of Sussex. He has previously worked at the University of Nottingham and Mays, as well as the Overseas Development Institute, and he is the editor in chief of the Review of Development Economics. So as you can see, we have uh, four very distinguished panelists, and I will now ask them a set of motivating questions. And also I will ask them to give their responses uh, within a maximum of five minutes in this first block of questions. Uh, let me remember the audience that you can ask uh, your own questions to the panelists using the ask a question section or the chat area, and we will, they will be answered in the end of the session. So the question, uh, the questions we want uh, to share with the panelists are: What are the main obstacles that may explain the lower participation of Southern researchers in scientific journal publications? What are the main limitations of papers submitted by Southern researchers that may explain their poor acceptance rates? And what are the main advantages advantages of Southern author papers that you feel could be leveraged better? So let's follow an, an alphabetical uh, order for the participation. So the first, uh, the first panelist will be Christopher Barrett. So uh, Chris, the, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Veronica. And, and thank you to the organizers for including me in the session. And as it happens, this webinar is taking place during the visit of 27 stars and stars plus fellows to Cornell University right now. STARS is a program for which I'm the faculty director. Uh, STARS is an acronym. It stands for the Structural Transformation of African Agriculture and Rural Spaces. We have a variant that also includes those from South and Southeast Asia. And the intent of that program is to, to provide research mentoring to early career economists, agricultural economists, and those in allied fields working on policy-related research. So it's very fortuitous. This happens during a moment when uh, I'm in spending a great deal of time with precisely your target audience as we try to facilitate precisely the objective of this seminar. That is to help promising young scholars at institutions in the global south to be able to navigate their way through to high level international peer reviewed journal publication. As it happens, one of our hosts, Kibrama Bay, was in the very first cohort of, of STARS Fellows. So uh, we, we proudly claim Kibrum as one of ours, uh, as somebody who was brought into a group where we provided some mentoring um, to, to try to help him to understand the unwritten curriculum, as some of us call it, the things that aren't in textbooks, but are routinely distributed through the informal knowledge networks that those of us at, at privileged institutions in the North um, we, we learn these things. We, we often learn them as graduate students or postdocs, certainly as young faculty being mentored by, uh, by senior colleagues. And that's enormously valuable in finding your way through to peer reviewed publication. Um, so I, I, I find this a really exciting program myself. I have greatly benefited from the interactions with talented young African and Asian colleagues who have terrific ideas, creative uh, insights on, on how to interpret data that I thought about differently than they did and they were right. Um, these are all advantages that they have coming into the publication process, but we have a, a peer review system that is very heavily slanted towards uh, those of us sitting at, at relatively privileged institutions. I can, I can come back to talk about more of that later in, in the later section. But I think the key things to overcome here are the, the unwritten curriculum that empowers young scholars to figure out how to find their way through the, the complicated path to peer reviewed publication in good journals and having journals that are, are very receptive to those who are, are maybe struggling against some of those obstacles. Why don't I stop there so that we can proceed? Thanks. So thank you, Chris. Uh, Enrique, do you want to go ahead? I think you are mute, Enrique. Okay, yeah, sorry. 
So first of all, let me just thank you all, the organizer of this uh, important webinar. I think it is a wonderful opportunity for us to confront and to learn from each other, but also hopefully from learn from the voice of the participants that, that are attending this webinar. Well, let us start first with your first question, Veronica. Uh, so I, I didn't in general, of course, the South of researchers may have a serious difficulties to enter into the academic, to fully enter into the academic debate, either for limited opportunity to present their work at international conferences, or also in several cases to have access to updated academic, academic literature. Um, often, at least in my experience, I can see that in many cases uh, there are papers that tend to refer to a more local or national or gray literature rather than to enter into the international debate. And of course, this implies uh, difficulties to meet the standard requirements for an academic journal. Uh, often, there is also a lack of uh, adequate uh, mentoring for younger scholars, uh, PhD students or postdocs, uh, from their own supervisor or even among the peers. So um, again, this is uh, something that is uh, uh, quite common. And I can see again in my experience that often, especially young scholars tend to send uh, uh, papers that are still half baked or still green in order to get comments and recommendations that usually you should be supposed to have from your supervisor. So this is in general. But if I reflect on my specific experience uh, with the Journal of Human Development and Capabilities, I will say that in, our journal is a multidisciplinary journal. So there are debates that uh, go across disciplines. And uh, uh, often uh, the papers are, include some more normative uh, or foundational arguments. So there are not just pure technical and critical papers that in a way cannot be easy enough to, to write, but these are much more conceptual or much more engaged with the theoretical discussion. And of course, this requires a quite strong command of language. And therefore here, the language barrier, I think it is one of, remain, still remain one of the So I think maybe I can stop here. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Enrica. So uh, over to you, Marcel, if you want to take the floor. Okay. Um, um, I was, um, I just wanted to make a few observations about the industry as it is. So, so we, your, your, the analysis that you reported on, this, the percentages that you gave um, are about based on the current uh, university of affiliation of the authors. But of course there are other, you know, if you're thinking about why, why, uh, why are they there? Uh, how did they get there in the first place? Um, there's gonna be a lot of variation. And uh, so I, I think that it would be very important in the analysis to, to have, uh, the university where the person got their PhD. Because if you look at uh, other parts of the world, so the, you think you are opposing, of course, the, the North to the global South, but if you look within the OECD countries, say Europe versus, versus North America, or even Canada versus US, you see there's a, or even within uni, <laughs> university with, universities within the US, you see that in enormous concentration. It's not, geograph not just geographical between Europe and the US, also geographical within the US. It's just basically 10 or 20 universities that produce virtually all the authors of the top 10 journals. Now, after, after that, these, uh, these researchers, after getting their PhD, they can sometimes they stay in the US, sometimes they in a US university, sometimes they go back to Europe, let's say. Sometimes they go back to countries, Africa or India or whatever. Um, if they are good enough, the question that you ask yourself, why is this author who's, you know, came from India, is attached to the, to the country, but then why does this author stays in the US? If they come out of Harvard or Princeton, they will have an opportunity to work in the US. So why do they stay in the US? Well, you have to think about what kind of conditions they would have when they go home. So it, there are going to be parts of the world where if you go home, you're going to be buried with, with work. This, this is also true of, of African, of, uh, of European countries, by the way. Some European countries, you go back and you don't really uh, get, you're not really given a chance as a, as a junior researcher. I don't, I'm not gonna give names and 
the situation has been changing recently. But so so many uh, many global South universities are not very attractive for people who have a high level of education. Let's say they, they got a PhD from a from a good university in the north. The only exception I can see that's beginning to to have a, a, a dif make a difference now is uh, South South America. I see people going back to Colombia, going back to Chile, going back to Brazil, Argentina. Those places are attracting very good graduates back. And so then they, they end up uh, uh, having facilities to publish because as, as, as was pointed out earlier, familiarity with the language of the of academia, uh, uh, of course, is, is a critical obstacle to publication in, uh, in economic journals in general. So I, I think that if you're, in, in, in you're thinking about the issue, it will be useful to look at what's happening in Europe, for instance. Yeah, there are very, very few. If you say, oh, well, these, these French people are in France, it's like, where, where did you get the PhD? Well, if they are Lafont, Tirol, uh, Blanchard, all those people, they, they, all, they all got their PhD in the top US university. And that's what determines their success more than where they currently are. The fact that they are in France means that, that part, at that particular point in time, France managed to offer them something that was sufficiently attractive for them to go back. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you, Marcel. Yes, uh, as you said, in our analysis, we are looking at the institutes where, where people are based. So that this is a kind of a, a of a limitation because we do not have the information about the place where they they pursue their PhDs, which would be very very interesting. And yes, thank you for bringing all these points into the discussion. And uh, we follow with Andy. Do you can you make your intervention? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Veronica, and thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this. Uh, in working on this, I did some analysis of the data from the Review of Development Economics just to see what was the record of researchers that were based in, 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 in more and less developed countries. Now, as Marcel says, what the data we have is where they currently are and not where they did their PhD or whatever. That, of course, is the more interesting information. But just looking at those that are based in poorer countries and basically outside North America and Europe, uh, the lower participation is an absolute fact. Uh, there are fewer submissions to start with. Uh, there are much, papers are much, much more likely to be desk rejected. Uh, and even if they do get to the point of review, they're less likely to be published. Now, I think one has to understand, and this goes back to points that Marcel said, the environment in which a lot of people work, the availability of support, the availability of the sort of informal network that Chris spoke to, this is often not available to people. People often have such high teaching loads and so on. They don't have much opportunities for research. They often don't have colleagues who are able to support them in terms of research. If they're lucky enough to have in their, faculty, in, in their university, someone who's had a PhD in Europe or North America, they maybe have more chance. But I think the challenges are much, much more difficult. And it starts from, I think, the research environment in which people, in which people work. Um, the sort of papers that we get from researchers based in, based in poorer countries are often very poor quality papers. They're often very poorly written papers. Now, I'm not talking about the English. I'm talking about the quality of the introduction, the ability to define and motivate a good question. The poorly written, poorly presented, sometimes they're just obsessed with technique, but not with the interesting questions. Now, you ask as well about the advantages. I think researchers based in poorer countries have the big, big advantage that they know the context that they know the issues. And as Chris said, often they understand things in the data, which those of us looking at it from a European or North American perspective might miss. These are huge advantages, but I think there are advantages which are really different, difficult to take advantage of. And also, which I don't think journals give enough value to this sort of knowledge and context and so on. I think journals don't give enough value to it. Let me stop there. Okay, Th thank you all for this first round of, of interventions, which have brought a lot of interesting points into the discussion. Uh, 
escape room if you want to to moderate from now on from the second uh, block of, of interventions over to you thanks veronica um and thank you thank you all um uh, uh the panelists the panelists um so we are now moving to the second part of the session which will focus on um uh, a bit beyond uh, explaining um rather we'll be focusing on um uh, how, how to address um, some of the challenges that we see in this uh, field. Um, so um, for this paper, I'll raise a few questions uh, to our panelists. And I also remind our audience to submit questions uh, because we will have time to um, raise some of those questions to our panelists. Um, so for that purpose, I'll directly go to um, uh, raise a, series, a couple of questions that the panelists may uh, address. So uh, given the challenge that um, that has been discussed um, and uh, the factors that were um, somehow uh, covered in, in a different ways, I mean, we range from institutional challenges in um, um, southern countries to um, um, language related challenges and others. Um, what do you think uh, in terms of concrete actions can improve um, uh, the situation that we have or the underrepresentation of thousand researchers? That's the first question. Um, the second question is, um, what can be the role of um, southern based organizations like PEP or other northern based organizations? I know. Um, um, there are um, several initiatives um, in North America supporting um, um, Southern researchers. So what do you think of their role and uh, what, what mechanisms can they follow to achieve um, some of their, their objectives? The last question is um, related to, um, obviously, I mean, your experience in terms of supporting Southern, Southern researchers. I know Chris uh, and Andy are, actively um, leading uh, or contributing or participating in the STAS fellowship. And I also know um, um, the other um, panelists are also contributing to, to the debate as well as supporting uh, Southern researchers. Um, what can you say in terms of your experience, um, particularly in terms of what worked best and uh, what not? Let me stop here and then um, uh, uh, give the chance um, uh, to uh, Chris, and then uh, we proceed um, as we did in the first session. Great. Well, thank you very much, Kibram. Um, I had prepared a couple of slides, but let me just show two of them quickly, because I think there are both supply side and demand side things we can do. Um, again, I, I think a huge part of the problem is the unwritten curriculum problem. Marcel referred to the, the propensity of scholars who graduate from elite programs, the, the premier programs around the world uh, have lots of options and, and many of them will elect, although from the global south, not to return to their home country because there's just a much better opportunity for them elsewhere. Part of their skill comes from the unwritten curriculum. It's not just that they're getting taught formal materials by the leading scholars. It's also that they learn all the unwritten rules. So there, there are two things we can do there. The first, there's a new book out by Mark Belmar at the University of Minnesota, which is basically aimed at writing down a lot of these unwritten rules. Uh, so the image on the left is just meant to, to, to recommend Mark's book to people, what you should have learned in grad school but didn't, which is in code for the things that aren't in the textbooks that really matter to doing economics and doing it well. The second thing we can do, besides just encouraging people to, to try to fill in the gaps in their training through things like Mark's book, uh, it, it, is try to engage in activities that take early career researchers and help them to build their skills, build their networks, help them navigate through to successful peer publication and then replicating that. And people often worry that this is a way of, of ultimately inducing people to leave the global south, that you get a talented young faculty member at a university in Africa, and they will leave. And, and I include this sand key diagram from this forthcoming publication on the STARS program, just to show that when we compare otherwise identical individuals, 
without getting into the details of the selection process involved for stars, we have a big pool of, of equally qualified people who just wind up not selected for stars for good as random reasons. We don't see any difference in whether they remain in Africa or whether they uh, move to the high income world. We don't see a difference between those who are finalists and those who were fellows. Um, so the, the fear that I've often heard articulated by donors that we want to be careful not to fund a program that facilitates brain drain, I think that fear is largely unfounded. There are real reasons for brain drain. Marcel's referred to, to a big one, just as to, does one have the opportunity to use the skills that you've built up. But I, I think this is often exaggerated, and we, we can and should be investing more in, in programs like STARS. I don't mean to push that one only, but that's the one I know best. And I think the evidence is it, it clearly is making a difference. I mean, we, we find significant effects on publication and citation rates. But the other is the demand side in journals. At Food Policy, we adopted an official policy around decolonizing research. And I have a, a reprodu reproduced version of our, our, of our editorial statement from our website right here. But the key is you can put things on a website, but you have to back it up by actions. Um, and we as an editorial team have been trying to do that. As a simple example, a recent high quality paper with field research, original field research undertaken in a, in a low income country, it was clear that there was lots of intensive engagement of local partners, but the original manuscript we received and reviewed had no uh, co-author from that country involved. So when I wrote back to say, this is a promising paper, the reviewers and I think there are a lot of things you need to do, but I can imagine a revised version meeting our standards, but I noticed that you don't have anybody from the country in which you did the research on the author team, yet the description of the research sounds like there were some folks from that country intensively involved. Can you please take a look at the credit, uh, the, the contributor role taxonomy standards and the, the Committee on Publishing Ethics uh, standards around uh, who, rep who deserves authorship on a paper and, and who does not, and please let me know whether there should be somebody from that country as a co-author. Lo and behold, the resubmitted version had as the second author somebody from, uh, from that country. I, I think we as editors and we as reviewers are obliged to ask those questions. I don't know the answer to whether there should have been somebody on the original manuscript, but by asking the question, I force them to reconsider whether they have inadvertently and inappropriately omitted somebody. The other things that we can do are improve copy editing. Um, Andy remarked about the quality of, of the core content, but we all know that there's often a problem with just the quality of the English language prose for English language journals. And we are pushing Elsevier, Elsevier is running a trial, we're pushing for food policy to be included in, in a system where the co-editors in chief can, uh, can basically use coupons for level three copy editing service. So not just correcting punctuation and reference section, but actually helping the authors rephrase things to make the, the text flow better. That's something I would suggest we should all be pushing commercial publishers and society publishers to do. There are these demand side things we can do. And, and finally, World Development and Food Policy and perhaps some other journals are about to launch a, a peer reviewer training program for uh, scholars in low and middle income countries which is intended to facilitate their use as peer reviewers so that they learn from the other side how to put together manuscripts well, what is high quality research, and they become better known, better acquainted, more comfortable interacting with the system. So we, our hypothesis is that, that will also lead to, to more submissions, more high quality submissions from that pool. So why don't I stop there? Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, um, uh, Enrica, do you want to jump in? Yes, so first of all, let me just congratulate you, Chris. I think that this STARS program is a really great idea, and I think we can very much talking support in scholarship in the South. So just related to what I said before, I think that, of course, it can be of help to offer more grants for facilitating the participation of Southern scholars at international conferences uh, within the Human Development and Competitive Association on the basis of the experiences that we have had, the, the used two years due to COVID, 
we realized that offering um, annual international blended conferences uh, can uh, try to allow to facilitate the participation of the scholars based in the South and therefore to try to, help to support a more strict connection among the scholars uh, wherever they are based. Uh, one thing that we did uh, in the past that was quite successful was to organize a panel session, editorial panel sessions during our conferences uh, on how to write and submit papers to academic journals. I have to say that this was not especially specifically targeted for scholars based in the South, but also for young scholars, whatever they are, because it's something that, again, to be fully aware about how, how it works, the process of uh, the review process is something that can be of help, especially if you, you can have a supervisor that can train you very well on this. Um, of course, I do agree with Chris um, to have more members in the editorial board based in the South can help, can help a lot. Um, another thing that can I think that can be of interest is, at least in my experience, that's been quite helpful is to have um, special issues or a symposia in the journal and this can be of help especially if the guest editors uh, can are able to create a sort of internal mentorship between more expert and let's say less expert scholars so again I, I i can see that this sometimes can work pretty well um finally let me just raise a, a, a concern a worry that i have so it seems that in the medium term, uh, a major problem will probably be the transformation of most, probably all academic journal as a full open access of journals. Uh, and this can create a substantial economic barrier for many scholars, not just those who are based in the global south, but as I said before, also for young scholars. So again, I think that this is something that we have to reflect because in a way, of course, open access can facilitate to have access to literature but on the other hand, on the, on the other end, can generate really some serious constraints for uh, less fortunate scholars. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thanks, thanks, uh, Enrica. Uh, Marcel, uh, the floor is yours. Um, four quick points uh, on on issues that came up earlier. Um, the issue, uh, Veronica, you mentioned familiarity. What I call familiarity. So basically, you know, familiar with the. Conditions in a in a specific country. I would. I just wanted to make clear that it's not because you live in a particular country that you're familiar with it. You might be familiar with the, the city the, the city life, but not necessarily with the, the countryside and so on. And this is also true for people in the north. It's not because you you're from the north and you're familiar with with the way the, the central bank makes the, its decisions and so on. So I, I I would say that the obstacle there would be I I you know do, I, do you get involved in field work? You get involved, do you get sent to the central bank if you're a macroeconomist? Do you get sent to the field? What are the opportunities for you? Is, is it an issue of funding? Is it an issue of collaboration? Uh, second, uh, brain drain. Um, yes, and I, I was, you know, I like Chris's uh, information, additional information about that. Um, I would also say that uh, it's good to have uh, Global South researchers in, in top universities. I think it's really, really important. I, I've noticed what having a whole bunch of really brilliant uh, uh, Indian uh, academics in the US deciding that they would go about under the umbrella of development economics, economics. and this was about you know, probably the turning point would have been 30 years ago, 25 years ago. They could have decided to become labor economists or welfare economists or something like that. Just like most Latin Americans uh, did, they, they went to call themselves macroeconomists and so they didn't call themselves development economists. And uh, the effect it had on the, on the field was enormous uh, in terms of uh, the recognition that uh, researchers from the global south are just as bright as anybody else. They can be just as bright uh, as anybody else, provided they receive the right the chances to get the right. Uh, training. So, so um, very few African scholars, very few, uh, quite a few uh, uh, Chinese scholars in the U.S. universities, but they go to econometrics or STEM fields or something like that. They don't, they don't really go into development. So, that these issues are again important about the brain drain. But I think role model effect of having African, let's say, African academics at top universities would be enormous. If you look at Leonard Monchekon, what, what he's able to do, basically. Language, 
the language, I think the, the suggestions were very good about language. We, we, we think about that as well. Most desk rejects are not based on, in fact, never, nearly never based on language, uh, except when it's completely incomprehensible, uh, then you, you think this person is not even capable of putting sentences together and it happens very occasionally. Um, what I would say is that what I've tried to do uh, when I was at the Journal of African Economies before, uh, and now at EDCC for the last nine years, is to, 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 to of course, I just reject most, uh, uh, probably 60 or 70% of the submissions, and they come from everywhere, not, not just the global south. Um, but uh, I try to give a chance if, when, if the paper has a, a good, uh, a, a good uh, piece of, uh, there's, there's a good core in there. I see a good core in there. I try to give, send them to referees. Now, that's more work for me. It's more work for the associate editors because that means that they sent papers that uh, um, are for, from, as we've noticed before, from people who are less well prepared for the, for, for what, for, for the task, basically, of publishing in, in top journals. And so they need more hand-holding. So, so I'm aware of that, but I try to give them a chance. Then I've, I discovered that after having them, after having sent them to referees, and then they get the referee report, I have to hold their hands on how to deal with the referee because they, some of them are used to uh, journals that publish anything they receive. So as soon as you pay the submission fee, they publish. So they think that referees, they don't really have to care about them. They're just like, oh, well, you know, I don't really think it's a good valid comment and they, they don't address it. But if you want to get published in ADCC, you really have to do, um, uh, you know, to pay attention to what the referees tell you to do. And so, yeah, so there is a lot of handholding to be done. If you if you engage in this kind of uh, in this case, in this kind of action, and there's still a, a large proportion of people who don't uh, get published, but I I think that last time we looked at that, we thought I think that BDCC was was a, a lot better than than say a JD in terms of a proportion of authors that were from the global south. As a result of that, thanks, Marcel, um, Andy. Okay, just, just, just a couple of thoughts. I mean, first of all, I think it's good to look at some countries that have made a good transition that used to have real difficulty publishing in the past, but has become much more successful. Latin America was mentioned. The other one I would mention is China. The qu quality of papers that we're receiving from China now is very good. And 10 years ago, it was not like that. So just understanding what's happened, what's happened in these cases to allow, to allow people to be able to submit papers which have got a reasonable chance of publication. Um, now, down to more specific actions. Um, I think uh, giving guidance on how to write papers, it sounds like a very basic and fundamental thing, but it's one of these things, as Chris mentioned, that you don't necessarily get taught in grad school, but just learning how to write papers. Now, papers done important things on this, but it's also not just a matter of, I mean, we can put up slides and tell people how to write papers, but actually I think a lot more handholding is needed than that. And of course, as general editors, we can't do that because uh, you know we get the papers submitted that we get submitted, but giving people support enabled in how to go about writing a paper and just highlighting how important it is to get the introduction right and get the abstract right. And if you can't do that, then you're not going to, to have a chance. I think another thing is because people are not in a research active environment, it's often very difficult for them to get any feedback, any peer feedback. Now, to what extent there are opportunities for people to get peer feedback? I think, you know, what can we do in terms of creating opportunities? Um, some of the earlier work of PEP has suggested how conferences serve much better the needs of researchers based in richer countries. To what extent can there be online alternatives? To let people uh, to let people uh, present present their work, um, we um, co-authoring, working with work partnership partnerships between researchers based in uh, wealthier countries and poorer countries can often be very extractive, but can also be uh, can often be very constructive and helpful. Chris has talked about the example of stars, which is exactly that about researchers based in 
richer countries working alongside and supporting researchers based in poorer countries. I've been involved for a long time with the African Economic Research Consortium, where again, uh, researchers based in richer countries are working with uh, and supporting researchers based in poorer countries. AERC, I think, has got a less good track record of those research, that research being produced into, translated into published papers, but there have been a number of examples of people producing very good published papers that are able to participate in these sorts of, in these sorts of networks. Uh, so I think these things are important. I think the journal editor also being willing to play some of the roles that Marcel talked about, about being willing to give some sort of handholding or some sort of guidance. You know, if we get a paper, which is, for example, it's an interesting idea, but it's just not well enough written as a paper, and I don't even want to send it to reviews. Sometimes we'll write back and say, we're not going to publish this paper, but if you rewrite the paper, uh, keeping the fundamental idea, but focusing on X, Y, and Z, then we might be willing to consider it for a review an another time. So I think just having this sort of flexibility to be able to do some of these sorts of things, I think is, I think is, is often useful. And I think also just highlighting to try to let people who are based on who, who are based in poorer countries but have the sort of field experience that Marcel was talking about to try and use that in a paper to make their paper more interesting, more alive, more exciting. I think that's also a positive thing. Let me stop there. Thank, thanks all. Um, um, this is all interesting. Um, See, we are now at a state where uh, we can accommodate, um, um, uh, we can accept questions from the audience. And I can see that we have got a lot of questions um, uh, and a lot of comments um, uh, and obviously um, quite uh, a number of uh, appreciation to our panelists. So what I would do would be, um, I would just raise um, some, some uh, questions that cross across um, different topics. Um, and then I will invite um, uh, the panelists to address, um, because you can also see um, the questions. It would be also great if um, you can select um, which question you want to address. But I think, um, let me start with one question um, that relates to um, editorial decision making at, at, um, at the journals that you, got, you are at. Uh, editing um, and the first question is like, how do you decide whether uh, a paper covering low and middle income uh, country is relevant? And do you ask the opinion of a colleague in working in the region or uh, how do you consider? Um, yeah, this is a broad question um, that um, um, one of you can address. Maybe uh, I can direct this. Uh, I can direct this to Marcel, and then um, there are some other quest questions that uh, Chris and Andy volunteered to address. So why don't we start with Marcel, and then I'll bring uh, more questions uh, to be directed to the other uh, panelists. Yeah, let me address the issue of uh, who gets to, you know, do editors make sure that somebody from the region looks at the paper? The answer certainly is, as far as I'm concerned, is yes. Uh, and uh, these are the people who reject you. Okay, so if you have a pair on India, there's probably for sure one referee from India, and uh, if the paper gets rejected, it's probably by this person. So, so it's not okay. So it's really about about the level of the paper. Uh, the relevance. This is a very interesting question. Um, there are some really relevant, very interesting questions, uh, research questions that we would love people to address. And uh, of course, because everybody would love this question to be addressed, there's, there's demand for, so that people will jump into the brink and say, oh, I'm gonna offer an answer to this question. And uh, the problem is that some of these issues that we really would like to have answers on are, are, are the ones that are really, really difficult to study. It's difficult to come up with uh, convincing evidence on. And so people jump in to provide uh, their opinion. Turn, at, the, at the end of the day, it's their opinion on a, on a really relevant question, but they don't have sufficiently convincing evidence. So I, I would say that uh, 
relevance, um, yes, but then the problem is, do, are, you, are you bringing convincing evidence to that question? Thanks, Marcel. Um, I'll proceed to the next question um, and I will direct that to um, uh, Chris and then maybe I think um, Andy and others can, can also add. Um, and I, I, I'm raising this, I, I can see that you, you were trying to address it in the chat, but I also want um, uh, the broader audience to see um, that, to follow the discussion. So I'm going to read it. Um, so how many of the researchers who participate in programs such as the STARS or the visiting fellowship at Oxford become uh, co-authors with non-African researchers. Um, uh, maybe Chris, you can start, and then um, uh, Andy or uh, Enrique can can contribute to that question. Yeah, thanks, Kibram. Um, the the direct answer is almost all of the papers that come out of the Stars program have a lead author from the Global South and a co-author from one of the high income country institutions where the mentor is based. Most of those are Cornell, but we do work in collaboration with Sussex, in collaboration with Michigan State, in collaboration with IFPRI. So sometimes the senior scholar is from one of those institutions. But that's baked into the design. This is a program where early career scholars from Africa or South or Southeast Asia propose a project that they want to lead where they could use some research mentoring, where they would like a co-author, a minor co-author who's a senior scholar who can help guide them. So this is expressly the design. Occasionally there emerge such significant modifications in the program or life gets in the way and the Southern scholar who is to lead this is incapacitated and unable to take the paper forward where the ordering changes. But that partnership reflected in co-authorship between Global South and Global North-based scholars is central to the whole design. Uh, Kibram is, is, a, is a live example on this, on this webinar of this. Um, and I think we need more of that. You know, the old design of we in, in privileged institutions like Cornell or Stanford or Sussex or IFPRI, we go out, we get a bunch of money, we start a field data collection exercise in some place, we get a local partner who we bring in, and we add them in as a minor co-author. There's often some, some significant impartation of, of skills and learning, um, but a fair amount of that is, is fairly secondary. It's not really the scholar from the context leading the research. There are important exceptions to that. Some of the very best development economics research is led by people who come from that, that context, even if they sit at a high income country institution. But we do need to be actively trying to reverse that, where the leadership, the intellectual leadership of the project and the lead authorship on the papers is coming from the global south. Uh, that just takes conscious efforts, and it requires some funding that's built to, to do precisely that as well. Over. Th thanks, Chris. Um, Andy, do you want to add to that? or? Well, I mean, I fully agree with what Chris says. And sometimes the, the, the way we fund development research doesn't help because the sort of things that get funded often don't necessarily help those based in poorer countries. And sometimes in other networks, uh, you know, the, the publications may not be co-publications between researchers based in poorer countries and researchers based in richer countries. So a number of papers that have gone through the AERC process with a lot of Peer, 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 peer monitoring and mentoring in the process. Some of these end up getting published just by the just by the researchers from the poorer countries. Now it's not so common that, but there are examples of that, and I think that's a good thing as well. It's sometimes that people can publish on their own, and yes, they've had support in the process, but they are the lead authors. Uh, and in terms of visit visitors to Oxford and stuff like that, I'm sure that just varies very much in a case by case basis depending on how those visits work out. Th thanks, Andy. Um, maybe I can write this question, Enrica, to you, and then also you can add if you have um, uh, more thoughts on, on the question that I also read. So it's a question um, related to um, if, um, yeah, uh, how this, this person is asking how many associate editors uh, or co-editors uh, bedded in southern countries do you have in your journal? Uh, maybe I think you can start with that and then perhaps add um, if you have more thoughts to other questions. 
Okay, um, we have a few, but, and one of them indeed is uh, attending to this panel right now is Enias Zadula, who's based in uh, Malaysia. So maybe Enias, you can say something more about your experience, uh, both as a editorial team as well as the scholars based in our Thank you, Enrica. So I think I'll uh, take this opportunity to kind of compliment uh, the points already made by um, members of the panel today. And I want to sort of uh, highlight something which I think we should uh, sort of stress a bit more, uh, which is uh, this incomplete understanding of what qualifies as scientific research and what is you know, scientific journal publication, particularly in the global north. And I raise this issue because there is this enormous diversity that exists uh, today across closely related disciplines and even within the discipline of development economics. And uh, so which is why we have a range of journals and uh, editors and authors uh, have very different ideas often about what constitutes a scientific publication. And this challenge is very uh, serious in the uh, global south. And this has been my experience as well in East Asia. And uh, I think this is also important because even today we have food policy, EDCC, review development economics and uh, general develop, human development and capabilities. But again, you know, in terms of scope uh, expectation, there are great differences. Uh, at uh, GHDC, uh, we have a greater share of narrative focused and conceptual papers. Enrica pointed this out. We are more open to uh, normative analysis. So we get very different set selection of papers. Um, uh, you know, and then we are also much more interdisciplinary. And then EDCC and uh, Review of Development Economics um, get a larger share of high quality causal studies and RCTs and all that, right? So I think the challenge that I see sitting in the Global South today is this lack of appreciation of the methodological diversity uh, that exists and how do we actually take advantage of that without compromising on quality of papers? Um, uh, because, you know, so there is this lack of understanding that there are different categories of research, the different types of papers, and regardless of the type, it takes a lot of effort to write a good quality paper. And, and this is where I completely agree with Andy's point that it's not about language English, but I think it is sometimes this uh, misconception that there are easy journals and difficult journals. Uh, if I'm to connect with our experience at Journal of Human Development and Capability, uh, of all the submissions we get from the Global South, India single-handedly account for more than 50% of the submissions. And yet, for the last four years, the acceptance rate for India is very low. As a matter of fact, the rejection rate is just as high for China as it is for India, and acceptance rate for both countries is you know, single digit, never exceeded uh, double digit. And it is despite the fact that we have seen tripling of submissions from India in the last four years. So again, I think uh, I would like to request the panelists today sort of kind of add to this point that will somehow in the global south, there is this perception that there are certain journals that are easy. For me, uh, that is not, not how I look at it. And we need to raise awareness on this and therefore, as specific response from PIP network and from our esteemed panelists today, I think we need to kind of emphasize on specific publication skills for certain type of papers. And again, uh, be aware of the fact that certain journals have you know, specific expectation. And then there is this importance of matching of what I have written and which outlet is interested. And again, in terms of the skill set. Um, and, you know, so I think this is where, uh, you know, Marcel makes this wonderful point of this concentration of uh, Northern trained uh, Southern scholars, some in the global North, but others in the global South. But I think the challenge is to de develop mechanisms to spread the norms of scientific journals and, you know, scientific scholarship. And again, PEP is a great network. Chris has highlighted this wonderful example of STAR scheme, but I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, uh, I think this is great, and uh, you arrived uh, at the right time. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, 
so um, we have got a lot of questions and um, some comments uh, uh, for us. So uh, let me uh, read this question and then um, I'll invite. Um, uh, so let me raise, let me use, uh, I think, prioritize one of the questions that I had in mind. Uh, uh, Marcel, I think you mentioned at some point um, um, the need for or the, the, your experience of hand holding within the review process before we arrived there. Uh, I mean, after we arrived there. So how can these experiences uh, be scaled up or can they be institutionalized somehow uh, supporting in the review process? I know like uh, initiatives like STARS and others, they do support um, uh, in the production process, but uh, you also highlighted the need to support um, within the review process. Um, is there, um, do you want to, um, I don't know who wants to, to um, add a bit to that or if there is any possibility to um, institutionalize or scale that up a bit systematically. I can say a few, a few words about that. Um, so if you think about what the review process is, you write something and you, some other people who are benevolent normally, um, look at it and give you feedback and help you improve the paper and bring it to, to a level that would be publishable. That process has to start before submission. And so there are some, you know, some of the things we've talked about here, uh, you know, uh, helping people attend conferences, uh, visitors uh, to the global, global North and all that. I remember when we had visitors from Africa and they, they see our seminars and they think, wait a minute, this is, this is quite tough. I mean, they are tough on each other. They're not tough on us. They're tough on each other. It's really competitive. It's a competitive industry. So that's the first re realization that I think it's helpful just to attend to, uh, to, to see these conferences and see the uh, that speakers get. And uh, it, anything that local universities can do, because after all, it shouldn't be just uh, editors of, uh, of journals who have to address this problem. This problem uh, can, can be resolved by actions by the universities themselves, helping their staff you know, I get a leg up on, on research and by uh, local governments by putting more money into uh, in research and support for research in their countries. After all, that's what, uh, that's what the Global North has done. And so I, I, I think that more effort to help the, these Global South scholars polish their papers before the summit, that would help a lot. Thanks, um, anyone who wants to, um add to that before I jump into the next question. Okay, um, I think the next question relates to, um, yeah, I, I, uh, this person is asking why are we focusing on journals and not, uh, or why are, not, why are we not covering uh, major uh, conferences like uh, Bread or other, uh, big um, uh, conferences, which are, um, I think also um, uh, important outlets and um, uh, um, uh, I mean, process in the, in the review process. Uh, anyone who wants to, to reflect to that? Happy to reflect on that. Um, so biggest conference development, Bread, uh, NBR, Seeper, let's talk about those those three. So for 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 NBER, you have to be uh, in a U, not even northern. You have to be in a U.S. university to be a member of NBER. So forget about uh, if you are from Africa. Okay. So you, you, the only time that you're going to be able to attend the meeting is if you are one of the authors. Uh, bread is a slightly different strategy, but uh, in the sense that they, they are trying to be across the Atlantic, so they're trying to, to get, it's a, it's, a no, it's a global north organization, uh, they're trying to get uh, European uh, scholars as well, but because nomination is by co-optation, over time what you've seen is that a small, a small advantage towards uh, uh, the US has trans trans transformed into a virtual uh, overwhelming presence of people from US universities because you get a majority of people to vote for you and this tends to be get reinforced over time because of the co-optation mechanism. So now it's 
I don't know, maybe less than 20% of the academics inbred are from Europe. Forget about uh, the Global South, again, because it's, a, it's an organization that caters to its members. It's the same thing for CEPR. So these, these three organizations are catering to their members. So you can look at the membership, but they have membership rules that, that uh, will not take uh, Global South members. So I don't, yeah, so there are other, yeah. So there are other organizations, I think, uh, the Econometric, uh, International Econometric Association and so on, they, 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 that are that integrate the Global South. So maybe uh, that's, these are the areas where, where there's a lot more that can be done, but they typically don't focus on development. Yeah, maybe I can jump in. Let me let me correct the incorrect use of the word big. Bread, NBR, CEPR are not big conferences. They're prestigious conferences. They're actually very small. That's precisely the problem, is that they're super selective, and that selectivity is very heavily based off of a social network. So if, if you have not come through one of the top... the 35 universities that think of themselves as the top 10, uh, you have a very low probability of getting selected into an NBR or BREAD or, or CEPR event. They're, they're highly selective and, and much of that is based off of signaling, which is imperfectly correlated with quality. So larger events are almost by definition more inclusive. The challenge is mounting large events is a complicated, expensive operation. So I, I suspect that the largest dedicated development conference every year might still be the Northeastern University's Development Consortium, NEUDC, mainly because it's the longest running one. The upcoming one is at Yale. There are usually about 150 papers or so presented and another 150 or 200 people attend. When we hosted it here at Cornell a few years ago, we had just under 400 attendees. That's an order of magnitude bigger than a bread event, uh, for example. Um, so the challenge is how do we mount larger, more inclusive, high quality conferences that are accessible in the global south? It's really expensive to fly people to North America or even Europe for these events. As Marcel points out, the Econometric Society runs events in Asia and Africa that get decent attendance, but that aren't dedicated to development. There are other conferences that rotate locations. I think of the International Association of Agricultural Economists, the next triennial conference will be in India. Um, but I think that's the challenge is, is being able to pull together the organizing committees and the resources to, to mount larger, more inclusive, but high quality events that are accessible to scholars based in the global south. Over. May I also add? Yeah. So, well, uh, of course, the, the UN Development and Capability Association is less prestigious compared to the other association that we just mentioned right now. But we have just had our annual conference in presence uh, after two years uh, in this week. And uh, we, indeed, it was in the mission of the association since at the very beginning, the, the association was founded in 2004 to really open up. The, and to facilitate the collaboration across disciplines and across scholars in a, a different stage of their career, so young scholars and more senior scholars, and uh, across countries. So uh, we, try to we try to do our best in order to facilitate the participation of uh, uh, scholars, young scholars and scholars based in the South. We offer grants. Uh, we organize a summer school before the, the conference that support especially uh, PhD students, especially in, in the further south. So we try to make this effort and I have to say that there is a large representation of scholars based in the south. Of course, this is just the first way for support with them, it's not enough. Uh, it doesn't mean that this is immediately can be translated in a higher representative in the, um, in the contributors of the journal, but I can see that this is very, views are very much appreciated by, um, uh, by these scholars. And we also try to organize uh, during the year webinars and events at the regional, in different regions, or for any specific topics, exactly in order to have a sort of ongoing discussion during the year with the scholars from different experiences and from different countries. Thank you, Enrica. Um... 
I think we're running out of time. Uh, Andy, do you have last, do you have anything to add to, to this or we can proceed to the? I'm okay, I'm okay. Great. Um, I've, answered, I've answered a couple of questions in the chat. Yes, perfect, that, that's great. Um, thank you all. I think we are running um, out of time. Um, uh, there are many questions um, and uh, there are even some comments for us in terms of how we can expand this um, going forward. And uh, we take those comments um, uh, uh, seriously and positively. Um, now, I think, um, yeah, we, could, we have five minutes over. I'll, I'll return the, the, the uh, uh, the 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 the, the modem to uh, uh, Veronica. Back to you, Veronica. Okay, thank you very much, Kibron. Um, just a quick uh, notice that about this last point uh, related to the conferences, uh, Pepe's uh, planning to to hold a second uh, event, a second webinar that is focused on the role of of development conferences. Uh, in this issue of the underrepresentation of Alpha. So we will have the, the chance to discuss that. Uh, well, I just want to thank you all, the panelists, for your valuable insights, and also Pep for organizing this event, and of course the audience for joining us, uh, for joining us in this discussion. So it's been a great discussion. Thank you very much to all the attendees. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.